Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. The title graphic we're going to use for our sermon series on uh, on First Thessalonians is "Let's get ready to rapture." I can't do it like he like he does, but yeah, that's 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 our title picture. We finished up Colossians last week, and we begin First Thessalonians this week as we continue our process through the Pauline epistles. As we begin to study the book of First Thessalonians, we, uh, we see that, as you read through the text, you'll see that just about every chapter, in fact every chapter, ends with an eschatological statement. Eschatology is the study of end times. And every chapter ends with the Apostle Paul talking about the coming of the Lord, the rapture, and the millennium, and the tribulation. He talks about all of that, and so the, 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 the theme of the book is our holy life today in preparation for the coming day of the Lord. And so I've chosen that graphic, let's get ready to rapture. The overall theme of the book is our holy life, our life before the Lord in preparation for, for what God is going to do in those end time events. So I want to introduce the series in, in a way. And you, you know that for me it's very important that we understand the, the historical context. Why did this book get written and to whom did it get written? What's going on in the place that the letter was written to that prompted these kinds of responses? So the first thing we need to look at is the date. When did this book get written? This is one of the earliest, if not the earliest. Depending on, Galatians is a little bit difficult for us to tell when it was written. Depending on when you put that down as being written, this may be the first letter that Paul wrote that made it into, into Scripture. Galatians may have been written two or three years early, but that's not, that's not sure. The dating of this book is pretty simple to conclude due to some pretty specific statements that are made by Dr. Luke in Acts, talking about when, when Paul and his team were there in Thessalonica. Acts 17 and 18 make it clear that the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians while in Corinth. 1 Thessalonians corroborates that fact as, uh, as we read through the text. We'll see that. In the temple of Apollos at Delphi, and remember when we studied Corinthians, we saw that the temple at Delphi was a, was a place of mystical powers and so forth. And we have a lot of artifacts from that temple. There's, a, uh, there's an inscription at the temple of Delphi that dates the service of pro, the proconsul in Achaia to A.D. 51 or 52. Gallio is specifically talked about in Acts 18, 12 through 17 as being that proconsul. And in, uh, in Acts 18, we see that that brings us to, that's the time when they're in Thessalonica, in 51 to 52. So we can specifically date when they were there, and we know the book was written just shortly after that. So we, we target the date of the writing of this book somewhere around 51 from when they were in uh, Corinth. That's how, how narrow a date we can, to get, we can get. 
the author of the book, the internal evidence, meaning comes from the book, it's very clear. It comes from the, from the Apostle Paul. The, the first verse says, Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to, be to you. Paul is, is the first listed, so he's the primary author. And I think sometimes scholars want to make this a little different and Sylvanius and Timothy are just with him. Rather, I would view this as the way Paul says this. Notice he doesn't say the Apostle Paul. He doesn't, he doesn't present his apostleship, his office, but he presents himself with Sylvanius and Timothy. All on the same line, all on the same, the same rank. I think all three of them had a... Had a, 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 a a work in this letter. Paul is the primary, he's the leader, so he gets the top of the masthead, but he, he looks at having Sylvanius, or Silas, as Dr. Luke would call him, and Timothy right there with him. Right on the masthead with him. This letter is coming from all three of them. Now what's remarkable about that is Paul is is writing that Timothy is his equal, and he's just a young guy. Remember, Timothy only joins the team in the second missionary journey, which is when they were there in Thessalonica. So Timothy may be just a teenager, but Paul is beginning to treat him with the respect of being an equal, being a member of the team, being a well-sounded voice. And we know that later on, Timothy is sent to Thessalonica. Timothy is sent to Ephesus. He's sent to other places. So this is a remarkable statement about uh, young Pastor Timothy and the, the way that Paul is treating him. I think it's important for us to see that as we begin to, to look at this text. So the, we have the date and the authorship. And who are the recipients the city of Thessalonica has been uh, a prosperous city for hundreds of years. It was situated on the banks of a harbor that provided protection and uh, simplicity of travel. The, uh, here's Paul's second, uh, mission, first and second missionary journeys. Thessalonica is uh, right up here. Where did it go? Right up here. In, uh, right here. Thessalonica, in this little harbor, in this little bay off of the Aegean Sea, in what is today Greece, then Macedonia, this, uh, this is one of the first churches in Europe. We've made the transition from Asia as we came across the mountains and into uh, Macedonia. We're now reaching churches in Europe. This uh, city was on the crossroads of a couple of major Roman highways. The, uh, the, Igna the, uh, the Ignatian Way, which uh, went from, from Rome eastward, went through Th Thessalonica, and then the major north-south road from up north in, uh, in Greece and Macedonia down to the harbors. It came at, to a junction with the Ign Ignatian Way right there in, uh, in Thessalonica. So they had a tremendous safe harbor where lots of boats could get in and offload their stuff and load their products on, and they had major roads going east and west and north. So it was a principal place of following, of, 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 of seeing goods move and seeing military go. Uh, Thessalonica became the province, a Roman province, a free province. They had their own government in Thessalonica. So they had lots of, of wealth as well. Um, it's estimated that there were about 200,000 people in, in the city proper at the time, as well as the people from the surrounding area that would come in that would swell it to over 600,000. It was a large, prosperous city. During Paul's second missionary journey, Paul traveled approximately 100 miles from Philippi through Amphipolis and, Ap and Apollonia to Thessalonica to plant a church there. Acts 16 through 18 covers this part of Paul's second missionary journey. 
So if, you, if later on this week you want to read about how this church got started, read Acts 16 to 18. As the Apostle Paul is beginning to move further west and he's planting churches along the way. We know from Dr. Luke's account in Acts that some prominent Jews and some wealthy women were saved and made up the charter members of the church there. As Paul normally did, he would go into town and go to the synagogue. And he went to the synagogue and, and he started preaching and people came to know the Lord. A lot of wealthy Jews came to know the Lord. A lot of prominent women in town came to know the Lord and they, they planted that church. And that was, was where God was working in that region. In Acts 17, 5 through 9, we discover that the, they were so effective in their preaching and in their ministry there that the rulers of the area got upset and evicted them and forced them out of town, drove them out because of what they were preaching. It was contrary to what the rulers of the area wanted to hear. Timothy would be sent back to them after they had escaped. They went on to Athens and to other places, and Timothy would be eventually sent back. So what's the purpose of Paul writing this book, of Paul leading the writers of this book? He was led by the Holy Spirit to write this letter to the Thessalonians to deal with some issues in the church after they were forced to leave. He didn't get to establish all of the doctrine he wanted to with them because he was forced out of town. And some, as happens in, in a lot of the early first century churches, false doctrine started to creep in and there were people coming behind Paul teaching false doctrine like we've seen in all the other epistles. Paul refuted the false charges made by the local enemies of the gospel. The local leaders in Thessalonica accused Paul, Paul's team of preaching the gospel for financial gain. That Paul was going there to make money. Not to preach the gospel, but to make money. Remember, Paul never took a salary from the churches he planted. He relied on others or he relied on his tent making skills for that. The local leaders in, in Thessalonica accused Paul's team of, of preaching the gospel for their own benefit. Well, that's an issue. Even in the early church, it was not the case for Paul's team. The local leaders also accused Paul and his team of being cowards for fleeing. You can imagine, you know, that's a pretty easy argument to make. We forced you out of town, and so you're a coward, so they can diminish Paul's effectiveness by telling everybody, see, he ran when, the t when things got tough. We also see in the book that Paul deals with some moral issues and even some laziness within the church. There's also some discussion concerning the proper respect for the church leaders. Remember, who made up the charter members of the church? Prominent women and wealthy men. And so there was conflict within the church early on about who was in charge. And Paul had to set them straight. So that's the historical context of the book. That's who wrote it, why he wrote it, and um, to whom he wrote it. So let's get into, into the study of the, the text now. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Paul begins the letter with a joint greeting with Silvanus and Timothy. As we stated earlier, Paul does not include his apostolic title in the teaching. It's rare for him. It's rare for him to write to a church and not say, I'm the Apostle Paul, stand up and take a listen. Listen to what I'm saying. Take notice of what I'm saying to you. He doesn't take that approach with the Thessalonians. I think because he felt that he didn't need to remind them of it. And so he could speak of Timothy and Silas on the same level. He's giving them some, some extra reward or extra, extra notice of who they are. I want you to think about the fact that Timothy is on the same line and on the same level with Paul here. He's still probably a teenager. It was during the second missionary journey that, that Timothy is brought into Paul's team. And he was a young guy. 
when, when they did that. Maybe still a teenager. Paul here, I think, was giving Timothy some, some extra encouragement. You know, Timothy was there early on in the ministry. He probably was the guy schlepping the bags for him. He was the guy, you know, picking up after them and, and running down to the, to the Starbucks to get coffee and stuff. But you can imagine as Paul and Silas, a little bit older guy, they're talking about what's going on and how to write this letter. And Timothy said, well, what, 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 about, what, what if we say this? Hey, boss, what about this? And so Paul's here giving him some encouragement, saying you're part of the team. Now they would have this, this, this mentor relationship for quite a while. It was a long time before Timothy was released on his own to, to take over Paul's team. But Paul began to give him charge and credit early on in their relationship to build him up and to make him a useful member of the team to encourage him and to solidify his authority. I think it was important for Paul to solidify Timothy's authority with the other churches because he was just a young guy. And we, we always think of church leadership as old guys. And here Paul was saying, here, he's a young guy. He's a, good, he's a good, young, productive member of the team. We had the privilege to, to uh, examine just such a young guy this week um, up in Sebring for uh, provisional ordination. A young, solid guy. He's only 23 years old. Only been to college, not been to seminary. But he did better than most of the guys that I've seen in their exams in the last several years. Even better than the guys that have been three years in seminary. He did an excellent job. And I was thinking, you know, I'd already been starting to prepare for this message. And, and as, we, as we were examining him, I was thinking, he's a Timothy. He's, he's hit the ground running and doing a great job doing those things that are assigned to him. He's an excellent preacher. He's an excellent student of the word. And he cares for people. All the things that Paul was teaching into Timothy. And I, and I think Paul is encouraging Timothy here by putting him on that same level with him. But then we move on. As Paul begins to talk about the, the, the people, what are we meant to look like? He, he tells them specifically, there's a reason that you're to be who you are. Let's look at this text that we read here in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father the work, uh, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does Paul tell us this? Why is he reminding them of this? One of the things I love about reading the letters of the Apostle Paul is his heart and his focus on the people. He loves them and he prays for them and he thanks God for them. Notice that Paul says, we give thanks. We give thanks. At the barest minimum, he's talking about him and Silas and Timothy. But I think his entire missionary team, how many ever that was, you can imagine they sit down for their morning devotions and Paul is, is ticking off the people that he's, he, the, the churches that he's been, been involved with, the churches that he knows about. And he's praying about them individually. He's praying about what's going on there. He's praying about their needs. He's thanking God for their, their ministry, for their reputations as we'll see. That's what Paul's talking about here. We give thanks to God always for all of you, const constantly mentioning you in our par prayers. I think that's an essential part of ministry leadership. We know as leaders that we're held accountable for you, and part of that must include praying for you and thanking God for you. Linda and I pray for you every night. The last thing we do before we go to sleep is we pray together. And we pray for you every night. 
what God's doing in your life and how God will, will lead you and encourage you in the, the ministry that you can have outside of this building. In verse 3, we see that Paul recognizes the character of the Thessalonians. He says he remembers the work of their faith and their labor of love, their steadfastness of hope in Jesus. Often in Paul's writing, we see that he's focused on the primary parts of our Christian life. Faith, hope, and love. That's the Christian life in three words. Faith, hope, and love. And that's what he's talking about here. You know, the marks of a good Christian. Specifically, Paul reflects on the reality that the Thessalonians had faith in Jesus Christ, which, which resulted in transformed lives. They didn't just say they believed and then lived the same way. They had transformed lives. In verse 9, we'll learn that they turned from idols to Jesus. They were part of the Greek mythological system. And they turned from following Zeus and Apollo, and they followed Jesus Christ. They had transformed lives. We also see that their conversion through faith led to works as it should. They did things because they were followers of Jesus. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To do what he tells us to do. To have good works. Not to get saved, but because you are saved. We'll get to the book of James someday and we'll see that in James. About the necessity of good works following our salvation. The work that the Thessalonians did was prompted by their love. The word used here for love is agape, which reflects selfless love of another. So they're caring and loving, not looking for anything in return. The Thessalonians were doing things for other people, not so that they could get stuff back, but because they actually loved people, because they were followers of Jesus. It's the perfect picture of the Christian. My, uh, my friend Newt Larson in his commentary to 1 Thessalonians states this. Believers would do well to check their lives and their schedules and notice what they do for others out of pure love. The church is not a club we join, a retirement plan we subscribe to, or a competition we enter to win a trophy. It's a family of love where we serve one another. This is possible only because of our relationship with God. Newt used to pastor one of the largest Grace Brethren churches in the, in the fellowship and uh, now is retired and his, his ministry is training pastors to, uh, to lead good congregations. And Newt gives some pretty good advice here based upon the text. True love is doing things for others and without the thought of what you get in return. It's, is that really even a gift? That's not really a gift. That's an investment. But Paul says the Thessalonians were giving to others, not expecting in return. Church is a place for those things to occur. We should be members to give, not to get. I uh, get frustrated when people talk about the church they go to because they get so much out of it. But what do you bring to it? That's the point. What do you bring to the, to the cross of Christ? To the church of Christ? What do you bring to the people that you fellowship with? If you just get and don't give, it doesn't work. And then you've joined a club. Or you've done something just for yourself. And not for those around us. Paul goes on in verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men proved we proved to be among you for your sake. Paul then moves on to, uh, moves out of the prelude or greetings into the body of the teaching. Notice he calls the Thessalonians brothers who are loved by God. This means he was writing to people he thought were Christians. He believes are Christians. And who are experiencing the love of God directly. 
They weren't just saying it. They were experiencing it. They were part of Paul's family. In a real sense, our family as well. When we sit down for the marriage supper of the Lamb, you ever wonder who you'll be sitting next to? Maybe there'll be some people from Thessalonica there who were experiencing God's love directly as one of the earliest churches. We might be sitting next to some of them. Or maybe we're sitting next to the Apostle Paul. We're all part of the same family. Paul then reminds them that they're part of the family because of the gospel, the good news that came to them in two forms. It came to them in word and it came to them in power. Because our gospel came to you not only in, in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. When Paul walked into Thessalonica the first time and he went up to the to the synagogue and he began to teach. His words were met with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's true evangelism. Your evangelism will do nothing if it's not met with the power of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit has been working on the hearts of people and preparing them and providing with them with the ability to have faith, nothing will happen. It's just dead words. Remember when Jesus sent out the 70? And he said, if they listen, tell them. And if they don't, go on to the next. The implication there being the Holy Spirit hasn't prepared them yet. So we should be praying about those advancements in the gospel. Praying that God will put in our way people that he has been preparing or maybe you're the preparation for the next one that comes along. What you say begins the process of the Holy Spirit. Evangelism always takes the Word and the Holy Spirit. It never works with just one of them. It takes both. We often don't think of the spiritual side of evangelism or of the Gospel. We think about what we say but not about what God does in advance or what we might need to do in advance to prepare for the advanced working of the gospel. It's not just the message that we proclaim vocally or in writing, the word part, but the gospel message also includes the supernatural part, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is foolishness to those who do not believe, Paul says. Why? Because it takes the Holy Spirit to prepare the field for it. The work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the unbeliever brings them to the point they can believe and provides them with the faith to believe. When Paul preached the gospel in Thessalonica, he was not doing it alone. He was doing it with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit's power. It's one of my big frustrations with seeker sensitive churches they're assuming that people are out there seeking after Jesus Paul would later tell the Romans as it is written none is righteous no not one no one understands no one seeks for God the gospel has to be accomp accompanied by the Holy Spirit so that they begin to seek because God sought them out first so we need to be praying for God to be preparing the heart for the people that we're going to come into contact with. So that as we begin to talk to them about the gospel or about coming to church, the Holy Spirit has already been active in their life. Because as Paul said, no one seeks after God. God seeks after them and has to prepare them for our evangelistic efforts to work. They need to be coordinated with the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit's not involved, it'll fail every time. Paul points out that when the gospel came to them, it came by the, by the words of Paul and the team, as well as the power of the Holy Spirit. They received the message because the Holy Spirit brought the message to them in their prepared hearts. And through His power, they received the message given by Paul and the team. That's the way it has to work. It can't work any other way. Paul then reminded them that 
Paul and his team were proven to be messengers in partnership with the Holy Spirit when they gave the message there in Thessalonica. That model is how, we, how it should operate today as well as it did back then. In verse 6 we read, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul and his team modeled proper evangelism when they evangelized the Thessalonians. In turn, the Thessalonians then became imitators of Paul. I think this is the way it's to work in the churches, in the church. Leaders model, model proper evangelism, and then the congregation imitates that model and evangelism, or evangelizes those around them. And I have to confess, I haven't done a great job of modeling that for you. Not a lot of people in this congregation that I've evangelized into the church. You want to see a pastor that really models evangelism, go up to Goshen this morning and see that happen. He evangelizes everybody. I think if he saw a stray dog on the road, he'd evangelize it. I had a discussion with, with uh, Jim at conference one year because they were down here on vacation and he led a couple people to the Lord down here. And at first I was, well, you're picking my territory? And then I thought, well, I wasn't doing it, so he was down here doing it. I think we, I think we have the potential to evangelize very well. The church body evangelizes very well in a setting here. It's just outside that we don't do very well. And that's why we went through the gatherers training. So that we can, we can figure out how to gather people here and bring them in and, and let the body, the spiritual body evangelize them. The gospel is, pre is presented just about every time we talk here. People know how to become saved when they come here. We just got to get them here. That's why we're we're renewing our, our commitment to, to, to having cards and stuff in your hand so you can invite people and bring them into, the, into this place where we can then, as a body, evangelize them. Notice at the end of verse 6 that Paul states the Thessalonians received the, the word with much affliction. Not affliction for Paul, but for the people of Thessalonica. They suffered because they became followers of Jesus and active in gathering and evangelism. When they became followers of Jesus, they turned their back on the Roman government. They turned their back on the Greek mythology system. They turned their back on the rest of their family that were all involved in, in all of that stuff. And they became alienated. Many of them had no way to, to get fed if it didn't come through the church. Because they lost their jobs, they lost their families. You go to Iraq today and you see the thousands of, of Muslims coming to know the Lord and they lose everything. Many of them losing their lives because they chose to follow Jesus instead of Muhammad. Paul and, and his team were forced out of town by the retaliation of those in town. There was... There was a, an assault going on against this early church. And it was difficult for those new Christians to remain loyal to God in such an environment. Despite the problems they faced, they remained steadfast in their faith and trust of God, as well as in their evangelism. So steadfast that Paul writes, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They were oppressed for their faith, but they trusted so much that the entire provincial area, what is most of modern day Greece, knew who that little church was for the things that they did, for the gospel that they spread, because they were so pronounced in their faith. That's how it should be done. Despite the struggle or affliction, they they faced the affliction that they faced, they remained loyal to Jesus and his mission to the point that they became examples to everyone else. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. We don't have to tell the world about what is going on in Thessalonica. They already know. 
When Paul moved on to another church, he didn't have to say, hey, listen, you know what happened in Thessalonica? Because everybody knew. They had a tremendous reputation. What a compliment coming from the greatest church planter that the church has ever seen. We don't have to tell people about your evangelism efforts because everyone already knows. The reputation of the church in Thessalonica preceded them everywhere. Macedonia and Achaia make up the northern and southern provinces of what is today modern Greece. And the entire region said, we know what's going on there in Thessalonica. What I see here is that we need to be mindful of our reputations. Your reputation says a lot about you. Our reputation is one of the things I'm proudest of for this church. We have a tremendous reputation in the district and in our fellowship. And that's not my fault, that's yours. It's because of, of all that you do to serve God. You've been willing to do things that needed to be done to serve the Lord, even at personal cost sometimes. A church in Laboul, Haiti, is meeting this morning in their own building because we bought the land for them. There are Central Africans going to church this morning reading a Bible in their language because we bought, a, we bought them for them. All the money that we had saved when the church was meeting in our house went to buy Bibles in Songo for Central African Republic. A new church is meeting this morning in Brooksville, Florida. A new Haitian church in Brooksville, Florida because we took on the project of collecting water for Haiti. Those are th just some of the things that this church has done to serve God. I could go on and on about the things that this church has done to earn a reputation of being dedicated to serving God. Despite our numbers, those things get done. Paul goes on, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned, from, turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul continues in the theme of the previous verses and speaks about what the other churches um, Paul heard from concerning the Thessalonians were saying. They had a reputation of being true followers of Jesus, having turned from Greek mythology to Jesus. Turning from that polytheistic world of every, of every building having a God, of everything being about seeing other gods to the one true God. How, to, how they continued to serve the living and true God despite the fact that they were financially, socially, and probably civilly inconvenienced because of their following of God. I want churches all around the world to say that about us when they hear about Friendship Grace Brethren Church. I want, us, I want them to say the same thing. Despite what goes on around in them and around them, they continue to follow and to serve God. Despite what the world throws at them, despite what Satan does in their midst, they're there following God. They're loyal and dedicated to Him. I told you last week that I had Watch the video of our gatherer trainer training that Tony Webb held here. In that video, Tony states that he wants to replicate churches like Friendship Grace Brethren Church. He wants to replicate our DNA in the church plants that they do all around the world. A church that's focused on the authority of the Word of God and is focused on making disciples. That's why we do the Bible studies that we do. That's why we do the in-depth studies that we do. So that you know what God has said. And that you can figure out how to figure out what God says. That's why we do those things. That's why we do those principal lessons on Wednesdays and on Sundays. When Tony and I talked about uh, doing our principal exercises as part of our worship side uh, service, he was excited about the possibilities of what that can mean for us. As we begin to... In a, in a collective on Sunday morning, vocalize and study together, all of us involved in what God has said. As you participate in services here, you learn that being a Christian, a follower of G Jesus is not passive. 
It's active. We speak up in services. We ask questions in studies so that we can recognize that being a Christian is not passively sitting here. Jesus never called us to be passive. He called us to be doers, to be active, serving Him. Not just here, but out there as well. That's the point. Despite the struggles of the last few months, despite my own failures, I'm excited in what God is doing here and what He will do in each one of you and through this church to present the gospel to the world. Each of us needs to be busy about inviting people to church. Invite your neighbors and your friends and your family. Invite them to come. Let them experience what you do here. Unless you're ashamed of what we do here. There's no reason not to invite unless you're ashamed of what we do. We need to be praying for God to put people in our path to talk to. But more importantly, we need to be praying that we'll actually talk to them. God puts somebody in your path and you say nothing, that's accomplished absolutely nothing. Or it's probably accomplished negative value when you do nothing. So don't just pray that people are in your path. Pray that you actually do something about it. God is much more planned for us to accomplish. He's not finished with this group just like he wasn't finished with the Thessalonians. Paul and his team got driven out of town. And how did they respond? So that the entire country knew who they were and what they were doing in following Jesus Christ. That's the message I want to send for us. Let everybody know who we are and who we follow and what God wants us to do. And then let's do it. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for these people that are willing to, to be part of this body, to follow you, to be obedient to you, to know who you are and what you've called us to do. We love you and, and we want to be obedient to you. We want to be your servants, your slaves but we're also your children. Thank you for that reality. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.